प्रसार भारती अभिलेखागार की प्रस्तुति सदा बहार सुनहरे दौर का अनमोल खजाना Hello. A few weeks ago, we saw the emergence of Asian cinema as a major third world force. In this episode, we will see the growth of another third world cinema. The only difference being that this cinema was born in the spirit of oppression, hatred and discontent. The emergence of vital national film cultures in Latin America and Africa, collectively known as third world cinema, has very little in comparison to the Asian cinema. If one could say that this cinema was born in hiding, developed in secrecy and released as a subversive activity against the oppressive forces of their dictatorial rulers. But one nation that really helped and inspired the movement of the South American and African cinema was a tiny island called Cuba. Of course, um, the, among Latin American countries, the one country which really they looked up to was, of course, Cuba. You know, Cuba was the first country to get liberated from this uh, imperialism and, you know, and that became a kind of a, you know, ideal for them to fall back on in terms of any cultural development, in terms of music, in terms of theatre and finally in terms of film. So the, when this people started making films, Cuba was their ideal. And Cuba, as you know, the cinema of uh, the Cuban cinema is the long tradition of the documentary school. Even when they are fighting the guerrilla force, they will have their camera with them. So they try to record each and every of their struggle, the people's struggle against authoritarianism. So that is a cinema which really influenced uh, the other countries. Under the training from the Institute for Cinematic Art and Industry in Havana, Cuba, several film directors came out and shared cause with their Latin American brothers. Leading the fervor was a very important Cuban filmmaker, Humberto Solas, and his film was called Lucia. Al poco tiempo volvimos también nosotras, pues mamá no resistía más la soledad del callo. Yo me alegré, así me sentía más cerca de él. Following the pattern of a classical Hollywood dramatic film, Humberto Solas gradually subverts the system by alienating the viewer with a strong dose of melodrama. Although it might seem a bit obtuse on the part of a revolutionary nation to arrive at a grammar as seen in this film, nevertheless, Cuba realized the importance of formal challenges on par with values of content and narration. Humberto Solas redefines notions of revolutionary culture with this highly acclaimed film. Another important filmmaker from Cuba was Tomas Gutierrez Alia. And Memories of Underdevelopment, on the other hand, focuses on the crisis of two contemporary cultures, each trying to assert its superiority and the resultant popularity over the people. The ideology of socialism comes into conflict with the material, tangible culture of consumerism and capitalism. 
Cuban director Alia boldly faces this dilemma in this film and seeks to provoke a dialogue with his viewers in this amazing work. Despite their great political and cultural diversity, these filmmakers from the Latin American countries had a lot of things in common. And at the primary level, they were not interested in making films purely as a medium of entertainment. Secondly, they were not interested in making profits for themselves or enriching individual production houses. And even when they had, uh, you know, development was taking the rest of the world, it was again a dark uh, years for them because of the imperialist uh, American nation nearby, which started their influence in their own way. So militancy and uh, the military regime was a sort of a common feature. That means one regime will be there, which will be a puppet regime of the, the Americans. And then after some time, some other. So all along, they had gone through this kind of phase of uh, existence where they had very little of freedom of expression. Or, so they have been this long tradition of uh, this continuous military rule, in a way, you know, projected their ideas when they started making films. So those films are true reflection of the suppressed uh, feelings of the people. Many of the Latin American filmmakers had their education in Western European traditions and got initiated into the art and craft of filmmaking in these foreign countries. One of them was a Brazilian and his name was Glober Rocha. Watching Antonio das Mortes could itself be called a subversive activity. Deeply rooted in the rituals of Brazilian tribes, the film follows a very structuralist path in identifying revolutionary paths, symbols of political valor which exist among the tribals and the melodramatic theatrical styles which are vehicles for these poems. One should, however, not try to compare this movement with the mythological couching of nationalist aspirations with the kind of films that is made in India. Because those kind of films which are made in India are really to be seen as part of a folk culture, as an ally with an establishment called the viewing audience. Films here are not protest films. Coming back to South America, we have two very important filmmakers from Argentina. They are Fernando Solanas and Octavio Jettino. Their film, The Hour of the Furnaces. This film, when released, created storms of all varieties. It is obvious, while watching this film, one realizes that this is no ordinary propaganda. The overlapping commentary text called A Spade, A Spade and used strong contrasting music tracks to emphasize the visuals like the operatic voice usually heard by aristocrats over scenes of object poverty. The Latin American cinema movement really spread far and wide. Cinema Nuvo was not going to be stopped just within Brazil. In Bolivia, we have another powerful filmmaker called Jorge Sanjains, who made a brilliant film called Blood of the Condor. And in Chile, we have a powerful filmmaker in Miguel Litin, and his film is Jackal the Nagual Tero.
In this film, Miguel Lytton blends the documentary style of the cinema verite and boldly fictionalizes the life of a criminal who is being tried for murder. Of course, one can notice the strong difference between Miguel Lutin's works and those of his counterparts in Brazil and Cuba. In a style which has almost become synonymous with a political commitment, this film uses handheld shots extensively, synchronous sounds, and a lot of commentary overlap to put forth the required message. Watching Lytton's works is as revolutionary an activity as anything else. It's very positive. It was extremely positive, very inspiring. I don't know for what reason people seem to love me very much. I also love the people here. Many of these filmmakers operated from production bases outside their country. For more often than not, these films were intended for showing to political sympathizers abroad rather than to viewers in their hometown. In this way, they could ensure that political opinion all over the world could get mobilized quicker and in a more powerful manner. While at the same time, they ensured that the artists who were behind these films were not physically endangered. No, actually they didn't export in the, in the commercial sense, you know, they did not have a commercial market. The only cinema where they had is their own people in the States, you know, like the Mexicans and the Puerto Ricans and the Costa Ricans and, you know, there are a lot of Spanish uh, immigrants, uh, I mean the Latin American immigrants in the UCLA and uh, Los Angeles and the New York and the, so that was the audience they were trying to reach out to and of course in Paris. Paris is the center of world uh, film culture, which they, they like to see the, the, the cinema scene in all over the world. From South America, the revolutionary movement moved on to colonial Africa, where Algeria, Senegal, and Morocco would lead the anti-establishment fervor with their powerful films. And one such country was Morocco with a filmmaker called Sohail Ben Barka. One thousand and one hands represents the harsh realities of an oppressed, colonized population, but by the mind of a highly sophisticated craftsman in Ben Barka. None of those crude handheld shots or live sound, but it is a picture of sure-footed analysis of the Comprador bourgeois culture which suffocated the free air of Morocco. An uprooted culture that dominated over centuries of tradition as seen in this carpet industry. I strongly believe that there is one filmmaker who has to be acknowledged in this episode for his unique inspiration to the Latin American film movement. His name is Louis Bunuel. I do not make this statement just because he spoke Spanish or because he lived in Mexico for a long time. But in his films, we see a strong streak of anti-establishment, an anarchic irreverence for anything that would be called order or control, and a powerful compassion for the downtrodden and the oppressed. And we can see a lot of these things working in his very early work called Nazarin. Almost at the same time that the Latin American filmmakers were doing their films. Although his films were structured differently, although they had very, very different purposes, nevertheless, his films remain a monumental source of inspiration for all revolutionary thinkers and filmmakers. Louis Bunuel literally 
set directors' minds on fire. For he taught us to think that to dream was not laziness, that to change was not impossible, and that the future of the world is as good or as bad as the position of their artists. And the contribution of Latin American cinema really teaches us to appreciate the value of such filmmaking artists. So see you in the next edition of Frame to Frame. Till then, goodbye.